I want you to know that the message I'm about to share, normally at this point in the service, there are two people who know what's, what's happened. This beautiful lady over here, because she has to put up with me, and normally Jared or Rachel or somebody in the video booth who I come in and I say, here are my notes, and here are the, the uh, Bible passages I need to have put up there. So he knows exactly or she knows exactly what I'm going to talk about. Nobody else. Rebecca almost teach, uh, spoke my message this morning when she was talking about Moses in the wilderness because my key verse for today is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 4, verse 1. And we'll break into more of this later, but you can all pull out your Bibles and go to Exodus. And the nice thing is we don't have to sing very long, right? Genesis, Exodus. We get there in a hurry, okay? Exodus is really quick in there, and we're going to go to Exodus 4, verses 1 and 2. And in that it says this, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Verse 2, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he just replied, it was a staff. We're going to break this down, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but uh, Lord, thank you for confirmation. Let's pray real quickly. Father, I thank you. I thank you that it is now time for you to be front and center. Continue to be front and center. Let everyone see you and hear from you, and let me get out of the way. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many people out there are what-if people. Is there anybody else who's a what-if person? Okay, I'm your king. I'm the king of what-if, and Julie will confirm that. I, I come by it honestly. My father was a what-if guy. Many times my mom would wake up in the morning and my dad would have been up all night long because he had a project. Mom says, yeah, dad was up again. He had a project. He was trying to figure out what he was going to do and what happens if this goes wrong. What happens if I have this problem? He tries to figure everything out that way. I came by that same gifting. Um, when I first got a job, all those what ifs came about. Then I started coaching. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night with really foolish questions. Quit nodding. You don't have to agree, honey. Questions like, what if the young man that I had planned to pitch gets sick and can't make it to the game? Then what am I going to do? Or what if... I get thrown out for arguing balls and strikes. That never, probably not often happened. Um, I know you don't see it, but I'm a little intense when I get onto a, a sporting activity, just a little bit. Um, but those are the kind of silly things that I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I would say, what if? Trying to figure out what am I going to do if that happens? Then I had children. And I'd get all sorts of questions about what do I do if my child gets out of line. Now my children come to me. And my children come to me and say, Dad, what if I punish this child for disobeying and they tell me they hate me? And I say, welcome to my world. It happens. And guess what? They get over it. Right? The best what ifs come from my grandchildren. What ifs like, 
What if Spider-Man runs out of webs? I don't know. Yesterday at the Millersport Sweet Corn Festival, my, one, my son had gone up to get some of these pumpkin donuts. And my grandkids had loved those. And my one grandson looks at me and says, Papa, what if Daddy brings back a hundred pumpkin donuts? I don't know. Buddy, I can't tell you, but you're going to have an awful sick belly if you eat them all. So they can come up with some of the craziest what ifs. In life, there are stages we go through. But there are plenty of what ifs that will come to us in every stage of our life. You're a teenager. What if that member of the opposite sex doesn't like me? Right? That's the big question when you're a teenager. And let, let me just say this. There's two sexes. Okay? I'm just saying, and so it's opposite. It's just the way it works. Um, you get older, you get married, and you want to start a family. And it doesn't happen right away. And you start saying, what if I can't have children? Questions we have to answer. You get older, and now you've got those children you were praying for. And now you're really praying. But now you've got all the obligations that come with a family, and you say, what if I lose my job? It's really tough. And then you get to my point in life. A whole lot older. Don't have those obligations. Well, what happens if I get some really bad illness? Again, there are all sorts of things that will try to come into your head and raise those what ifs. That's what's happening to Moses right here. As I always do, we're going to dig into the scriptures and go backwards a little bit and see how we got to Exodus 4.1. In Exodus 3, Moses is out in the wilderness, right? He's a murderer. He killed an Egyptian who was going to abuse one of his Israelite uh, counterparts. And so he's out tending to the sheep, and he has his burning bush moment. Right? He comes to this burning bush that isn't getting burned up. And in that moment, he's talking to God. And the conversation happens, and we find it Exodus 3, verses 7 and 10. And it says this, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, what do we get in that? God says, I, God, have seen their oppression. I, God, have heard their cries. I, God, am aware of their suffering. And I, God, am coming to rescue them. And what did Moses hear in this? He heard God say, I'm going to send you to take care of it. That's what he heard. He suddenly took all this on himself. He felt he was responsible for setting the children of Israel free. 
And because he took it all on himself, he's now questioning things. He's written God out of the equation, laid it on his own lap, and he starts saying, God, I don't have what it takes. Right? Look at me. I'm a murderer, God, and I stutter. I can't do this. He's questioning his own ability and worthiness. And we go to Exodus 3.12 and we hear what God has to say. And God makes it very clear. He says, and God said, I will be with you. Whoa. Moses, get a grip. God just said, I'm going to be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. He couldn't have been more clear. Right? I will be with you. You're not alone, Moses. Give it up. This is not on you. Do your part. I'll do my part. Seems really simple. The next thing Moses says to him is, well, God, the people may want to know who you are. What's your name? Names meant a lot back in that day. What you call your children means a lot today. And it's not just their name. Right? Don't call your children dummy. Foolish. Whatever. You're putting that on them. Names mean a lot. And Moses wants to know what God's name is. And God said, tell them I am has sent you to them. His name is I am. At this point, Moses' lack of faith is on full display. He wants to know how this is going to happen. He's not willing to step back and just trust God that it will happen. He says, God, I need to know. How are you going to do this? How is this going to happen? I don't have what it takes. God's merciful. Exodus 3, 16 through 22. He lays out the plan that he has. And he says this. He starts it with, now go. How many of you have children? Okay. Have you ever had your kids, you're getting them ready for bed at night, and they say, Dad, I forgot to brush my teeth. Dad, I, I need a drink of water. Yeah, six or seven times. Yeah, get that. I've been there, okay? And what do you en end up saying to them? You get frustrated and you say, now go. Right? At least that's me. And I believe that's where God was at this point. Moses, I've told you what you need to know. Now go. He says, now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me. He told me, I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. All right, so, so far, he's told them, go. Here's what you are called to do, Moses, and this is your part. You don't have to do the rest. You do this. Then he tells him what's going to happen. He says, the elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. The elders are going to hear what you say. They're going to believe it. And then here's your next assignment. You and the elders, go to that king. You're going to meet with him. 
and you're going to ask for this. Then he tells him what's going to happen next. Verse 19, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. So I, God, will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go, and I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so that you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters in these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. All right. How much more detailed plan does Moses need? Here's what you're going to do. Here's how they're going to react. Then you're going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and this is what's going to happen, and you're going to leave with all the riches of Egypt. Seems pretty simple. God has laid it all out for him. And then we get to our key verse. All of that happens, and Moses' response is, what if? What if they don't believe me or listen to me? He's seen God's plan. He knows what he's to do. He knows what's going to happen. And he's still saying, what if? He starts by blaming the people. What if these people don't believe me? He's concerned about what might happen. The fact of the matter is, it's his own faith that's lacking at this point. He's not trusting God can do what he says he can do. God immediately turns it around, kind of ignores the what if question and says, What is? What is that in your hand? What he's saying is, I told you I am. I am what you need in this season of your life. And when you get to the next season, I am what you need in that season. And when you get to the season after that, I'm already going to be there waiting for you because I am what you need in every season of your life. Right now, you don't need all this other stuff. You don't need a staff that can part the Red Sea. That's not for a while yet. You don't need that. You don't need one that can turn the Nile into blood or can hit a rock and bring water. What you need is to be able to show the people that you've heard from me and there is a plan that God has that will bring you out of Egypt. Now, I talk like that, like I'm talking negatively about what ifs. I am not. What ifs have their function. They're needed in different seasons of our life. Think about it. When we were planning this event, it didn't just come together by happenstance. It wasn't just luck. We asked a lot of what ifs, right? What if the people don't get on board? What if we go out and knock on doors and people turn us down? What are the things that could happen that we need to be prepared for? Next week is the Great Harvest Party, and it's going to be awesome. Bring people. It's our responsibility to reach out to the people that we brought in and and turned in prayer requests for and talk to them. But we've got a plan. We've done our what ifs, right? What if it rains? What if there isn't enough parking? What if somebody gets hurt in the bounce house, like me? Okay? These things can happen. So we're prepared. But the fact of the matter is this, at some point, we have to get out of the what if. And when God tells us to move, 
our response should be to move and not continue to ask what ifs. See, that what if can be a tool that the devil uses to get us to avoid God's calling on our life. See, what if can lead you to why not so you never get to the what is that God has planned for you. So we need to think about when that what if comes. Is it supposed to be asked? God's telling Moses, trust me, I am. I am the answer to every question you have. I am the answer to every need you have. Do you trust me? You need healing. You've seen it today. He's the healer. You need prosperity and provision. That's your source, not a job somewhere. See, the reality is Moses wasn't questioning the people. He wasn't questioning his own ability. He was questioning God's ability. I want you to do me a favor here. Close your eyes. You get a chance to do this. Anybody snoring, I'll have the ushers remove you. But I want you to paint a picture in your mind. I want you to paint a picture of God's will for your life. What do you think it looks like? What do you think his calling looks like in your life? Right? Is it for me, am I down at the beach somewhere and then I'm going into a church and sharing the word of God there? Or am I sharing it with people on the beach? I got this wonderful picture. All right, now open your eyes for just a second. Let me ask you this. What could come against that picture that would stop it? You see, any picture that we have of God's will in our life that's not big enough to overcome the mistakes that we make is not a big enough picture. Any belief that we have about God that doesn't take into account my flaws and failures is not a big enough belief in the God who controls it all. Each of us needs to have that in our heads. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to do the things in the natural that we can do. All right, before I got up here to preach this morning, every time I do this and I have that opportunity, I come with multiple copies of the message I'm going to share in paper form. Why? Well, I could lose one. I could spill water on one. Pastor John could pull a joke and go over and take it, just saying, how can you handle it now? Right? That does sound like Pastor John, doesn't it? Yeah, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So I've got paper copies, and I'm ready. And then when I can't do that, like this morning, when my printer didn't have any ink, I email them to Angie, and I say, Angie, could you print these up here? So there's more copies ready. And then I always bring my laptop. You'll see I'm working from my laptop today because I mailed them to the wrong email address. Okay? So I am now at the end of my wits because I've prepared three different things. And then before I came up here, and every time I do this, I've got a mental checklist that I go through, all right, of things I'm going to do to be prepared. The first thing I do, if you go over my little black folder, you will find 55 cents in change, keys to my vehicle, keys to this building, you'll find my wallet and my iPhone. Why? You don't need to see me up here doing this. Okay? And I'd have that tendency to do it. Now, honey, we've got some shady-looking characters, so keep an eye on that for me while we're going on. So that's the first thing I do. 
All those things come out and they're in that spot right there. The next thing I do, I brought up a bottle of water. It was already opened before I came up. Why? I can picture it being there and it's tight and I go and I'm squeezing and I do this and the water flies out and I get up here. Now I got to preach while I'm soaking wet. So it's already opened, so I don't have to worry about that, okay? The last couple things I do, I check to make sure that my zipper is up and the microphone's on. <laughs> um, all those things I do before I get up here. But at some point, I have to stop all this preparation and let go and let God take over. You see, all our preparation can diminish God. We can try to take God out of the equation by preparing ourselves into submission. There is a time when God says, move. And we are to move. <sighs> there it is. It's back. Um, so, yeah, you're laughing. You're thinking the battery's about to die on this. Just so you know, the power cord's over there, and there's an outlet here. <laughs> I am ready, okay? If this thing dies, we got a whole other problem to deal with. So, so what are the things in your life that cause you to ask what if? Job. That's a good one, right? You start your job, what if? What if this? What if that? Probably one of the best ones I've already mentioned. Children. Children will get you to say what if. Okay. What if I'm too hard on my children? I don't know that I ever asked that, did I? Probably not. What if I'm not hard enough? Well, I raise an entitled brat. What if that I set a poor example? What if I let them hang out with the wrong friends? What if I try to control them too much and that causes them to rebel and they end up in prison? See how you can take this to the next level? You've gone from trying to say who they can hang out with to suddenly your kid's in prison. All with your what ifs. And those are good questions. They're valid questions and they're questions we should ask. But we should ask God. God, what would you have me do to train up this child in the way you want this child to go? But when you get done with all that what if, you need to turn that child over to God. It's his responsibility ultimately. He's given you an assignment. Are you looking to him for wisdom on how to fulfill that assignment and then saying, God, I trust you. You're in their best interest. So children, what else? What else can cause us to ask what if? How about the calling God's placed on your life? Anybody here ever wondered, did I miss God's calling on my life? Yeah. Or am I operating in a calling that God didn't call me to? Am I in the wrong place? Or the one we all ask, I don't have what it takes to fulfill that calling. What if I can't do it because I don't have what you need? Let me answer those three real quickly. You missed the calling. I missed it. God, God gave me a clear direction, and I missed it. Guess what? He's a God of second chances. He's going to bring it around again, and you're going to get the chance to step out and step into what he called you to. 
He's not going to let it go once. What if I went into a calling that's not my calling? Guess what? He sent us the Holy Spirit. He's given us a helper who is there to help direct our steps. And if we need to be redirected, as long as you're leaning into the Holy Spirit, you will be redirected to the path that he has for you. And my favorite, what if I don't have what I need? The reality is that's the best place you can be. Because if you don't have what you need, you've got no choice. You've got to lean into God. You've got to rely on him. And that's where he wants you. Because it's in relying in him that we'll have what we need because he is the great I am. So, back to our, our key verses. Moses and God are having a conversation. Moses is stuck in the what-ifs of his assignment. The reason is really simple in my mind. He doesn't want to do it. He's trying to find a way out. And God has a whole different mindset. He says, not what if, but what is. He's basically telling Moses, stop looking for a no when I've already given you a yes. Now, I told you before, I'm the king of what if. The one good thing about knowing that is now I can be attentive to that. Right? I feel bad for all those who are in our admin group. We have a meeting, typically Mondays, sometimes Tuesdays. It tends to move once in a while to Wednesday or Thursday. It depends. But every week we have a staff meeting. We have an admin meeting where we go over all the things that happened in the Sunday service. And it's kind of a time to ask, all right, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What could we do better? What if? And a lot of times, lovely Miss Angie will look at me and say, Pastor Jeff, what you got? Because I say, well, what if? And again, there's value to that to a point. Because again, there's a time to stop. And when you know that you're a what if person, it's important that you recognize that and say, okay, enough. God's telling us to do this. Time to do it. Society's given us a whole lot of reasons to ask what ifs, hasn't it? You're about to send that email. You're about to get on Facebook. You've typed out something that you want to say, and your finger is poised over the post button, and you say, what if somebody misinterprets what I said? That could end badly. Should I send this or not? What if somebody takes what I'm saying wrong? What if I prepare a message? This, is, this isn't really much of a what if. What if I prepare a message and I share that message up here and someone is offended? It happens. But what if, because I said something that offended someone, they leave the church? And what if that person, I'm, I'm going to go down this what if road. What if that person gets really mad? And what if that person starts posting negative things about me and FFCC? And what if somebody who needed to come here reads that and doesn't come, and they miss their salvation and end up in hell, all because of what I said? We can what if ourselves into the grave. But at some point, we've got to say, what is true? What is real? What is it that I can count on? What is God calling me to? What is it that the word of God says and is what I'm saying lining up? We need to, conv to change our mindset from what ifs to what is. 
And that's exactly what's happening here. Moses asked, what if? God says, enough, I'm ignoring you. What is that that you have in your hand? Now, we all have this common flaw that we'll take it a step further. What if I, what if I, right? We lay it on ourselves. Our problem is that we're trying to measure our ability to handle what might be a problem in the future based on where we are today. God's not going to let you stay where you are today. He's moving you forward. He is the great I am. He will be what you need when you need it. When you get to your Red Sea, he'll give you the ability to separate it. When you face Goliath, he'll give you that slingshot and five smooth stones. He's really looking for people with unshakable faith. He wants us to get out of this wilderness of what if and into the promised land of what is. Now, I'm going to conclude this by going back to a little bit of what I shared about Pastor Josue in the very beginning. I think most of us recognize him as having an apostolic calling on his life. God's prepared him and he's ready to do that. Am I correct? We need to recognize that we have a part to play. Okay? Galatians 2.20 says this, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Folks, Christ is inside of us. Now we are the ones that can be the answer to what is needed to allow him to go into his calling, to fulfill the apostolic calling that's on him right now. We are called to co-labor in the kingdom. This may be your part. Your part may be to do something that allows us to let out more kite string. Let him fly and do what he's called to do. We may be the tools that God wants to use to bring the kingdom of God to places like Cuba and Argentina and Guatemala through this man right here. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to step up and be that answer. The fact of the matter is, there are things that are needed. You heard him talk about being here when he's not gone. That weighs heavily on him. If we look at the number of people that attend a Sunday service, and he's not here, and we see that number's way down, he starts to wonder, should I have left? Should I be out doing this apostolic thing when at home people aren't coming because I'm not here? That should be a simple thing. I am going to be here. I am. Will everybody else? Will we come even when he's not here? Who's going to lift him up in prayer when he's gone? That's needed, big time. Because some of the places he may go may not be as forgiving as it is around here. And you can say the wrong thing and bad stuff happens. Who's going to reach out to others in the congregation who have a need? He does some of that. It isn't just pastors, admin staff, who can do that. Each of us can be the hands on that reel that allow him to do what he's called to do and then come back and bring with him things that he receives, such as this. Who's going to reach out 
or who's going to be a part of helping in the food pantry? Who's going to be helping back in the children's ministry, running the cameras, the sound, the lights, the video? That's something one of us can do? Certainly. What's God calling you to do? Step up and do it. We have this thing next week, the harvest party. You want, to, you want to be a major, you want to put a smile on his face? I don't know how many of you have that desire. I do. But if you've got a desire to do that, here's something you could do. Many of us sit back and wait for somebody to say, hey, could you help with, here's a thought, call the office, 366-7931, dang. Call them. Say, hey, I'm willing to help. I don't know what you need, but I am willing to help at the harvest party. Let me know what I can do. Can you imagine the smile that's going to put on his face when 20 or 30 people call in there and say, hey, I got your back. I can do that. It would make things so much easier for everyone and help us in the same mode by letting us know that we can make a difference. See, we are called to be the hands and feet. We are called to do our part so that other parts can do theirs. I may not have an apostolic calling on me right now. That doesn't mean I can't help someone who does. Each of us needs to get out of the wilderness of what if and move into what is God calling us to. So let's please take advantage of that. Change your mind step and start thinking, what is it God wants me to do to bring the kingdom to here, to the community, to the nations? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you that you are our, hmm, our great I am. We know that we can have faith and trust that you will see us through. You will bring us to what you want us, where you need us. Father, let us not what if ourselves out of your purpose for us, but let us see what is, what is needed, what is it I can do. Father, we thank you for it. We'll give you glory for it, and we will praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Our three phrases is yet to come. If God did it before, he can do it again. Shalom. Thank you.